Hi there, and welcome to another profile of an impact executive, Leaders with Courage. Today we have my dear friend, Carrie Kennedy, human rights activist, president of Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights. Carrie, welcome, we're so glad to have you today. So great to be with you always, JR. Thank you. Carrie, before we dig in, actually, uh, we've been doing this conversation in a number of different ways throughout this corona you know, virus period of time. And you've been showing this video that just to be candid is the perfect way, I think, to kick off this conversation. Is there anything you'd like to say to kind of tee this video up before we watch it and then start our conversation? My, my dad, Bobby Kennedy, was running for president in 1968. And it was important for him to win in Indiana. He called his dear friend, uh, John Lewis, and asked John to come and help organize the black community in the Indianapolis. And John organized the biggest rally of the campaign to that day. Um, and it was in the largest black community in Indianapolis. That was April 4th, 1968. When daddy arrived in Indianapolis, he got a call from then, then Mayor Richard Lugar, uh, uh, who later became Senator, who said to my father, you can't go to that part of the city. We're afraid of riots. There are riots in 125 cities across our country. Don't go. And daddy called John Lewis. And John Lewis said, come. And my father said to Lugar, you know, this you might not feel comfortable going there, but I could go with my pregnant wife and my 10 children tonight and sleep on the street and we'd, we'd be fine. And daddy didn't say that out of bravado. He said it because he had such a strong and long relationship with John Lewis and community leaders in black communities across our country. Um, that night he spoke and uh, Indianapolis remained calm. Uh, other cities, 125 cities across our country burned. Dover, Delaware was under martial law for the next nine months. Um, the next day, my father canceled all of his, uh, his campaign appearances except for one. He went to Cleveland and he spoke at the Cleveland City Club, which was a bastion of white power. Mm -hmm. He did that because immediately on April 5th, uh, the, the bastions of white power across our country started saying, now we don't owe the black community anything because they have, um, they have burned our property. And so my father wanted to counter that and to say to the white community, you have a special responsibility because the source of your power too often comes from the repression and the violent repression of black people. And that's the way our history has always been. So he gave this speech known as the mindless menace of violence speech. And we're gonna watch a short excerpt of that right now. Americans' life is taken unnecessarily, whether it is done in the name of the law or in defiance of the law. Whenever we do this, then the whole nation is degraded. And yet it goes on and on and on in this country of ours. Too often we excuse those who are willing to build their own lives on the shattered dreams of other human beings. Some accuse others of rioting and inciting riots have by their own conduct invited them. This is the violence of institutions, indifference, inaction, and decay. This is the violence that afflicts the poor, that poisons relations between men because their skin has different colors. This is the slow destruction of a child by hunger and schools without books. This is the breaking of a man's spirit by denying him the chance to stand as a father and as a man amongst other men. We learn at the last to look at our brothers as alien. For when you teach a man to hate and to fear his brother, when you teach that he is a lesser man because of his color, then you also learn to confront others, not as fellow citizens, but as enemies, to be met not with cooperation, but with conquest. 
to be subjugated and to be mastered. He learned to share only a common fear, only a common impulse to meet disagreement with force. But this much is clear. Violence breeds violence, repression breeds retaliation, and only a cleansing of our whole society can remove this sickness from our souls. We must admit the vanity of our false distinctions and learn to find our own advancement in search for the advancement of all. Gary, every time I see that video, I, I just, I am reminded of a couple of key things. Uh, first, that there are leaders in our history that knew how to lead well through periods like today. Uh, and honestly, you know, in, with the passing of John Lewis and sort of the moment of time that we're in, you know, I can't help but number one, like want to see leaders like that more now than ever. And uh, in all sincerity, I think you are one of those leaders. And so I guess I wanna ask you a question. Can you walk us through what, it, what when you think about this moment in history and with what we just saw, like give us some context, like wh what are we facing right now? What kind of moment are we in as a society and as a country? Well, you know, I think we're in a moment of enormous change and uh, where there is potential for extraordinary change. And to me, that's very exciting. Um, you know, there's a Chinese curse that says, may you live in interesting times. And um, that's what we're living in. We're living in interesting times. We have the coronavirus that uh, we have the, um, our, our economy is plummeting. Um, the numbers have come out recently, 32% across the year. Um, for black people, there's a 50% unemployment rate. Um, the, there's an incredible sense of fear about the future, of uncertainty about the future. At the same time, there is a willingness to create change. You know, we saw all those protests in the wake of George Floyd's killing, and they were uh, unlike the 68 protests, which were almost exclusively black, these protests are a real mix of black and white together and Latinx as well and, uh, and uh, others. And I think there's a real sense of demand for change um, at the White House, in, uh, in state houses across the country, but also in the way we conduct business in the way we treat one another. And to me, that's really exciting. You know, Carrie, it reminds me of something I've heard you say, you talk about all the time, that we have too much cruelty, hatred, fear, all the wrong stuff uh, that exists across society. I hear a lot of hope in your voice, which is great to hear. What role does human rights, act, uh, activism, and education, what role does that have to play in our way forward? Well, you know, human rights education is um, the way we do this at Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights is we teach students what their rights are under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was, uh, which was signed by virtually every country on earth. And it came out in the wake of World War II. Um, and it said all human beings are born with dignity and basic rights, the right to food, the right to health care, the right to housing, the right to be able to vote, the right not to, to, to have a fair trial, etc. So I think that's one thing you need to know that. You also need to, to know how to assert those rights. So we teach students um, community organizing skills, bringing people together, that you need to vote, yes, but voting is not enough. You need to vote, you need to organize, you need to protest, and then you need to vote again. You need to hold the, um, the elected officials accountable once you voted for them. Go to those community meetings, show up at City Hall. 
Uh, and then the third piece about it is social emotional learning. Really understanding what your emotions are. What's the difference between feeling angry and feeling fearful? That's something that very few adults can d distinguish between and very few kids distinguish between, but it is key to resolving issues. So we can't work together. We can't cross boundaries between red and blue, left and right, um, until we can work, until we can speak to one another with dignity, understanding, and love. And that's what social emotional learning is all about. You referenced uh, the, the appropriate racial unrest. And, and in particular, I think you identified something that I think is really critical, that this is across, the, the, the protests have come across race. I've even seen it, I think the other piece of this is it's across socioeconomic barriers that have historically been there, which I think is a really powerful thing that we haven't talked a lot about. I haven't seen that in the news as much. Uh, I know that you recently published uh, a, an op-ed with John Rogers. Could you talk a little bit about the role of the private sector, the role of the investment community, and how we kind of set these systems right together? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, I think we have to really take a look at the, the injustice and the, the impact not only of the anti-black violence, but uh, but anti-black access to uh, to financial institutions. So, as I said, 50% unemployment rate for black people today. Um, redlining, you know, redlining is uh, is the practice of excluding Blacks from getting loans or being able to buy houses in certain neighborhoods. That started in 1934 um, with the housing, Federal Housing Act. Um, the rate of Black home ownership today is worse than it was in 1968 it's gone down. From 1992 to 2016, college educated, uh, uh, the net worth of college educated white people went up by 96%, 96% for whites. For college educated blacks, the net, their net worth declined by 10%. So this is, this is the reality of race in America. And those are just a couple of statistics. There are many, many more out there. What we've done at RFK Human Rights is we've brought together the investment community. So they control about $70 trillion in assets managed. That's basically all the money in the world. And we talk to, um, we bring together about 250 people twice a year who control about $7 trillion, about 10% of the world's economy. And we talk to them about the impact of human rights violations on investment outcomes. Right now in that $70 trillion industry, what percent of those investments go to women and minority owned firms? The answer, less than 2%, less than 2%. It's not because white, old white men are so much smarter about investing than women and people of color. Mm. Um, it, this is about racism and it's entrenched racism that we have to start to undo. So. We have challenged the investment community to take a series of steps. Um, name five black people to the boards of your companies over the next 12 months. Allocate 5% of investment funds to black owned firms. Redesign contracts so that black businesses can compete across all the contracts, not just for maintenance and food services, but for legal services and financial services. And then screen your portfolios, 
eliminate businesses that support a racist economic and legal system. So things like predictive police software, private prisons, um, predatory lending uh, establishments. Uh, and then look at your workforces all up and down the supply chain. Assure that there are collective bargaining rights for everybody. Even if they're not in a union, they need to have collective bargaining rights. Make sure that every single person has a living wage. Um, you know, so these are some of the some of the issues that we've raised. Do you think we'll see the the private sector finally change? Do you think we'll see companies really make it make a change? I mean, I, I just I just have to ask only I ask that to context because I I keep giving my kids hope. I keep saying, you know, look, I it's got to change. And I'm just curious with what you see and the people you talk to, you know, do you think it's going to happen? You know, I think change does happen. And I think it goes, we, we sometimes make progress and then sometimes we retreat. And um, I think that's the way it goes. But I'm hopeful, you know, I, I believe uh, what Martin Luther King said that the the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. I think if you look at the last 2,000 years, we've gotten progressively freer, um, and that's a good thing, but I think it's hard. You know, one of my favorite quotes from my father is, um, everybody loves progress, but change is its motivator, and change has its enemies. <laughs> Indeed, sure. change has its enemies. It's a good line. Um, and I think, but this is what gives me hope. When I started working in human rights, which is the early 1980s, all of Latin America was under right wing military dictatorships. Today, there's not one left standing. Hmm. All of Eastern Europe was under communism. Today, there's not a communist government left. South Africa was at the height of apartheid. Today, South Africa has had a series of freely elected governments elected by a majority of their people, and women's rights was not on the international agenda. Today, CEDAW, which is the Women's Rights Convention, has been ratified by 193 countries. So I think that um, things are moving along. I think what happened with corona is really interesting. The, the difference between a hero and a, vil, a victim is activism with a with a open heart. Mm -hmm. So a victim feels like there's nothing I can do. Poor me. And a hero says, I'm going to create change on behalf of the people in my community. And what happened with Corona is everybody stuck inside with this terrible disease and feeling there's nothing I can do except for wear a mask and not see my friends or family or go outside and, and plant a garden. I'm just stuck. They feel victimized. Hmm. And when George Floyd was killed, people said, here's something I can do. I'm not going to be a victim on this. I'm going out and I'm going to march and I'm going to be active on this issue. And I think that that people are just, there's incredible willingness at this moment in history to take charge, to create change, to say we are going to forge a better world. That's great. It makes me think of a, uh, a line actually from your father's mindless menace of violence uh, speech. I'm gonna read it and then ask you a question. He said, the question is not what programs we should seek to enact. The question is whether we can find in our own midst and in our own hearts that leadership of human purpose that will recognize the terrible truths of our existence. Uh, as I listen to you talk, that the, the image that came to mind is this idea, this leadership of purpose, these virtues that we need to sort of extend as leaders into the places that we lead, the people that we lead. Your dad led with tremendous virtue. It came from great faith and great character. 
I've watched you lead with great virtue. I've watched you put together boards of people who lead with great virtue. And I, I guess I'm, I, I, as a closing question, if we need to see one type of virtue in our leadership today, what, what would that virtue be? Love. I mean, that's the driving force, you know, if you, you, you can have courage, but if you don't have love, right? Good. And, yep. Most, most powerful force on earth. Right. The most powerful for, force on earth. And there's that great quote, which I'm sure you can recite from the Bible that I can't quite get there with. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. But, well, uh, you know, if you have not love, but that's yep. it. We, we, we need to love each other. We need to te- treat each other with compassion and dignity and value. And incidentally, if we want a roadmap to creating all these changes, all you have to do is take out a copy of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and read it. It's all right there. I agree. Well, Carrie, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your time. And I would admonish everybody that's, that's going to watch this and hear it and share it. What RFK is up to is worth supporting. What Carrie is up to is worth reading and getting behind. Put your voices behind it, your dollars behind it, your energy behind it, your organization behind it. You guys have one of my favorite events and nights of the year. Could you kind of walk us through what, what you've got coming up in the gala that's, that's coming, up, coming here in the next little bit? Sure. Thanks, JR. So we have an amazing gala coming up. It's on December 10th, which is International Human Rights Day. And we are honoring Colin Kaepernick, Dr. Tony Fauci, Dolores Huerta, who co-founded the United Farm Workers with Cesar Chavez, Dan Schulman, who's the CEO of PayPal, and Dan Springer, who's the CEO of DocuSign. All extraordinary human beings and really, really deserving of this. And then uh, for a light touch, we also have the great Chris Tucker, who's going to be a ma- our master of ceremonies and keep us all laughing in between. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I have to say that I truly, that, that's one of those nights, you know, there's, we all have these dinners and banquets and events that we go to, but that has consistently been for me, this reminder of why I built Handshake. Oh. I built Handshake because I believe that the private sector has a role to play in righting the wrongs that we see across society. And that if the private sector will stand up and truly bring business solutions to these problems to solve, that we'll we'll see a a different kind of world get made alongside of the non-for-profits and the government leaders that also we need to hear from. So I would encourage all of you to take part because it really truly is an inspiration, so. Thanks, JR, great to be with you.